uh, CAD CAM and 3D printing. So um, what we do, uh, again, you can just read there, what we try and do is to offer a wide ranging, uh, uh, seamless transition from people that want to start looking at initial CAD right the way through to CAM, right the way through to 3D printing and things like that. So it's to try and give you a, a one-stop shop when it comes to this sort of technology. Um, I know that a lot of you are fully aware of what 3D printing is, but I think that when you start to, to look at it and you break it down, traditionally it was based on working with purely making prototypes in the very early days. You can see here, so you want to make something, you draw it on a CAD, and then you produce the part you see here. But obviously as things have started to develop, it's starting to see how it's maturing in recent years. And, and moving more and more into the production environment where you start to see a lot of interest from uh, very large organizations. Um, again, you know, you look at today compared to how everything has, has sort of grown to a little bit of a halt and, and who knows what's gonna happen over, over the next months, but certainly what I've seen in the last sort of three to four weeks is, is, is obviously companies taking stock of, of what they may need to do in the future to try and look at some of these things and, and who knows really where we go from here. But when we start to look at uh, all of these challenges that you can see down the right hand side, it's pretty straightforward that we need to try and sort of adapt and change if you want to try and improve in any way. Um, from a manufacturing point of view, and looking at additive manufacturing or 3D printing, what I try to focus on are looking at all of the key areas that are sort of not generally recognized in, in additive and 3D printing. Jigs and fixtures, for example, which are these two top sections, are ideally suited to additive. And it certainly seems to be one of the key areas where people are starting to, to look at things where they want to try and improve in lots of different areas and, and understand really where it, it touches the areas which people didn't actually originally think of. Um, if I go into a company and look at the, the uh, into a tool room or an assembly room, I look at the, the standard things which could be into obviously R&D, but you've also got assembly lines, packages you can see here, and equipment, health and safety, quality, so in CNs, uh, sort of uh, 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 CMM inspection parts and things like that. So when we start to look around and we look at how things are conventionally made, I tend to take a little bit of a look back and look at the whole manufacturing floor and to look at the areas where sort of additive and 3D printing can sort of uh, have a benefit. Um, since it first started off in prototypes, you can see there in, in the top left, that's obviously a traditional sort of approach, but when you start to look along the, the, the top with jigs and fixtures, and even things like metal forming tools, you can use a, a 3D printed tool and you can metal form it up to six mil thick metal parts. So you can actually really start to uh, get the best out of this technology. With the thermo falling, uh, thermo uh, cooling tools and forming tools, you've got parts that are 3D printed where their porosity is also their benefit, where you actually need to have the thermo cooling properties and where you need air to actually get parts off, a really, really uh, uh, important benefit. Uh, the injection and blow molding tool is really very, very small part. It's not really looked upon as being that key to additive. So it is something that's touched on, but not that, that interest in, in certain cases. But the middle two, the composite tooling and the soluble cores, this is really every single Formula One uh, team in the UK start to make and start to use composite tools made from uh, high temperature all-term materials, which are replacing uh, aluminium tools. Uh, the soluble cores, meaning you're 3D printing the actual core, the soluble part, you're wrapping carbon fiber around that part, and then you're dissolving the core away. Something that is given some major benefits to, uh, to customers and how they're starting to use this. So you can look down through some of these and, and, and obviously there's a particular area on here where you think, right, I want to know a little bit about that. So we can sort of like, I can ask questions and send people information if there's a particular area that you want to look at. So I'm not only tend to go through all of these. You can just see that perhaps there's some of these applications where you think, oh, I've never sort of considered that as a, as a 3D printing uh, technology. Um, I, I think when you start to look at the uses of the technology, it always test, it's always best when you actually get cases from, from customers. Uh, and, and this is one of their high profile uh, case studies where you can see the type of, uh, this, this is a car where in fact the window alignment fixture, which is a very heavy fixture has been sort of 
uh, shall we say, just modified over the years, over the years each time. And this was the actual uh, fixture that was used to uh, put the windscreens into these cars, a very heavy fixture. It wasn't designed to to suit the operator, it wasn't designed to suit the process in each thing, but it's just that that's what they had and that's what they used. So the the whole idea, and this was a great case study in which you can then take a design of a shape and you can then look at the main core features that need to be kept in that shape and then using 3D printing to be able to then generate something that is quite marvellous in this technology. Uh, just sort of previously go back to that. Um, there are a number of, this in itself is a case study where there are probably about 10 to 12 slides going through all of this process of, of, of how this particular part got from the original this to that. So I can obviously go into that into a little bit detail if anybody wants this. But in effect, the, the whole point of this part was made through a very simple software, just using Fusion 360, which is free to educational facilities, and using a bit of uh, generative design modules and things like that and options there. It went from the previous version to this. It cut the weight in half. It made uh, a much simplified uh, use of, of a of a quite complex and cumbersome part that's used in automotive, but they've used it for years, so it's, uh, it always seemed an ideal sort of solution. So you can look at some of these sort of things and you look at the challenges and you look at the outcome of some of these parts and you've got there. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's looking at 3D printing and, and, and really just at how in the UK it's impacted on companies. Um, and Hopefully this, uh, this is a, a, a nice video of what's been done at uh, Morgan Motor Cars. So uh, hopefully you can hear that. Can you hear that okay? I think, Colin, we're going to have to restart that because I think the sound uh, is coming through. You want to restart that? Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you want to restart the video? Because I think the sound is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I can't hear any sound. I don't know, I don't know what the, need, the sound needs to be on. My, does my sound need to be switched on? Why? I heard something coming on. There we go. Just, let's try that. Let's try that. Yeah. 
Sorry, Colin. <clears throat> I wasn't sure if that was me or everybody else. I think it's very quiet. <laughs> it's probably best if you just take us take us through it. I think, uh, Colin. Well, I think this is one of their, um, I suppose, their most hands-on uh, automotive customer that we work with. And the guy you see in the picture there, Dave Moore, he's one of their top sales guys. And he only lives just down the road from Morgan, so he's got a real personal interest. Um, but like with Morgan, they're a custom car maker that want to make uh, very customized things for their own uh, uh, individual clients. So 3D printing is, is perfect for that. Yeah, sorry about that, gents uh, and ladies. Sorry, it was ever. <laughs> uh, I think the. Can you hear? Can you hear me, um, Colin? Yeah, I can. Okay, I'll leave you. So this is a this is a, a company that um, make a lot of packaging parts. Um, so what you can see um, is the opportunity that three D printing can offer to give full color, proper representation. Um, I'm getting a bit of a back echo here, so. Okay. So, um, when this company approached us, they wanted to have uh, Pantone colours. They wanted to have colours that were truly realistic. And at that time, the 3D printers that were available uh, offered colour, but they were quite uh, like a pastel colour. So in the end, customers just painted them, which seemed to completely uh, defeat the object. Okay. They, <laughs> The reason I've put this slide up is um, there is a lot of work and development in uh, in the uh, drone industry, uh, UAVs and things like that, where uh, we've got one company in the UK that started off making just one or two parts for their drones. When they bought a system in in house, they then could see the major benefits of it, which in then turn allowed them then to start making 50, 60 percent of the drone in house through 3D printed. So it's this having the ability in house that enabled that to do this. Um, and this is what we found with this uh, with the US uh, Department of Defense, where they've taken it to the next degree, where they really are starting using it for a lot of mass production. In, in drones and UAVs. So you can start to look at some of the money that's involved and some of the saving that, that can just by sticking on the right part and the right application. Um, when we start to look at 
how additive and 3D printing and production is starting to uh, develop. We have to look at the various things that are used. Traditional manufacturing is, as we know, CNC machining, injection molding and, and casting, which there's nothing wrong with that, of course. Um, but when we start to see how we can incorporate additive manufacturing and subtractive manufacturing, this is really where we start to see the benefits of, of using both technologies. You need to manufacture something. You can't always think that additive manufacturing is going to be the answer to everything. And I think that when we start to look at something like this, which is, uh, as you can see, is, uh, is, is a bracket that goes onto a car, conventionally machined, conventionally inspected and things like that, you start to look at um, how can we improve on this standard process? How can we look at that and be able to make that slightly differently? And I think that when we start to the part and we start to machine it, We all know that standard manufacturing, CNC manufacturing, is probably 99% of everything that's manufactured. If we have to start to adapt and use additive manufacturing, there are certain new tools at our disposal. Uh, I don't know if many of you have heard of uh, generative design, but this is really where we can start to use software tools to re-engineer parts that have been conventionally manufactured. Now, this is using Fusion 360, so this is uh, a low-cost software where we can identify where the key loads need to be on a particular part. The red areas that you see here are the areas you need to avoid. The green areas that you see here are the areas that you need to include in a design. And from that, the software can create a number of cloud-based options you can then select from those options what would be the best outcome for your particular application. And from that, it will come up with a completely new design. Now, the beauty of this is that although you've made this new design, and you may have changed this design because you wanted to make it 20% lighter, 30% lighter, it still means that you can conventionally manufacture it. So it's not saying that if you use uh, generative design that you then can only use uh, uh, additive manufacturing this is still a way that people that have got conventional machine tools can still get the same benefits from using some of these new software tools that you see here Okay, I want to, before I moved on to the next slide, what I wanted just to emphasize a little bit on is that we have looked at how we can redesign and change the manufacture of this part. Using generative design, we can still CNC machine it. But if you look at the back end of this, the holder part that is this, that is still very much conventional. It's still a very expensive vice and you still probably in some cases can't actually machine all the way around that particular application. And I think this is also where we're starting to see a lot of developments in additive and, and 3D printing is as much of the changes in the jigs and fixtures using uh, generative design so that the part that you're holding can be more machined better. So we're not just using the vices, we're not just looking at using this technology to the part, but also how you clamp it, how you hold it, are also major considerations of, of the use of the technology going forward. This is really now where we take this to the next stage, where
Sorry, I keep playing the same slide. <laughs> I'm, I'm losing it. Now, um, if you wanted to then take it to the next stage, which is say, okay, so if I'm going to get the real key benefits out of using uh, additive manufacture as the manufacturing to give me the lightest part that's possible, we can use this what's called hybrid manufacturing, which is a combination of using generative design, five axis machining, but also as you can see in this particular image on the inside of this, there's a lightweight structure. So what we see here is how we can take the technology to the actual ultimate level where we are using another software that's part of the Autodesk called NetFab, where if you know you've got to manufacture this using uh, a laser bed in this case machine and CNC machine it, you've then got the best of both worlds. Because with your Renishaw systems, for example, you can then laser manufacture this, and then using your CNC machines, you can then finish machining. So this is really where um, we start to see the, the ultimate advantages of using the combination of uh, complex CAD, CAM, uh, you've got simulation software, and you've also got the ability to have access to uh, laser-based um, additive manufacturing machine and obviously three, four, five active CNC machining. So if you put all of that together, this is really where we start to see uh, the major advantages with the technology. So what you see here are the, uh, the parts that have been manufactured in different states. The one on the left is the original part directly from conventional CNC machining. Then the second one you have is, it's 90% lighter because it's gone through generative design, but still CNC machine on the same machine. And we can then start to see that if we start to use the, the true technology for the full additive manufacturing, you can then go from a part that is then 59% lighter. But the stage three and four, this is really where we start to see you do need to have access to additive manufacturing and if on the, the right hand side you then have to make 10,000 of these a year for example you can then start to see the upscaling of, of using additive is probably one of its barriers to be able to get this into the mass production that we've got here um, these are uh, these are actual parts that are are used where for this case where Again, using uh, generative design, we can then start to see how this original part is, is morphed and changed into the organic shape that it's then used. Now, these are not um, just CAD images of, of parts. Each one of these would have a strategic uh, set of conditions with it that make it suitable to uh, this particular application. So the strength of it, the weight of it, where the forces are applied, how it's machined, are all built into this through the Fusion 360 uh, generative design. So instead of having several parts that have been uh, machined or uh, bent manufactured conventionally, you can then have a part like this you can see here that still has the same strength, the same performance, but obviously has the major benefits of being a lot lighter. And, and the reason why automotive companies are, are really going down this line now is because certainly the uh, the influx of uh, electric vehicles, the thing that all electric vehicles need to do is to drive as far as they possibly can on one charge. So you can only do that if you can make the cars lighter. If you make the cars lighter, you make the batteries bigger and things like that. Whatever combination you have, 
if you can take weight over the edge of that car, it gets, gets you that extra three miles, extra five miles on that particular uh, on that particular model of car. And I think this is really the race now to try and make the lightest possible car, maintaining the strength and being able to get up to some of these uh, ranges where, you know, three, four, five hundred miles on one charge. On one, you get to that sort of stage, we then hit a point where people don't have this uh, barrier of thinking, how can I drive somewhere and get the car charged? You, and, and once we get past that point, we can then start to do this. So it's the development in batteries, the development of using technologies like this are all driving uh, the technology forward. So, um, and I think that when we start to not just look at how additive manufacturing and the use of metals, for example, is concerned, is how we can start to make this more accessible to to certain industries and certain technologies. This is a picture really of, of metal injection molding. Uh, and the one technology I, I work with is called desktop metal. And the desktop metal can look at these sort of range of parts and additively manufacture these based on an office-based sort of system. Um, so Nick's fully aware of some of this technology and obviously I can send over parts later. But it's a three-stage process for desktop metal. So you print something, you put it through the binder, and then you, you center it. The printing part of this is is very much a like an FDM printer. So it uses a, a metal and wax-based rod that is melted through an extruded nozzle, and then generates your part automatically. This is here now showing you really where the future of the technology, and I've shown this, Nick, on a number of occasions, and this is still really where the technology is gonna be moving to make things faster and more mass production. It works by combining two powder spreaders and one zip unit into a single pan system to both spread metal powder and print. Unlike existing metal 3D printing, there is no wasted motion with single pass jetting. A single pass starts from the powder spreader, where a metering system deposits metal powder, and a compacting system forms a layer, as thin as a human hair. The twist bar follows, jetting directly to the binding agent. Millions are jetted per second, binding metal powder to form high-resolution layers. Probably best if you take us through this, Colin, because we're getting a lot of feedback. Okay, okay. Well, this is really where the ultimate in, in additive and 3D printing is, is, is going. We've, we've seen the uh, where laser technology is, um, and we know that with the laser developing parts, um, which each laser has to make each part, this is building a complete layer of parts in one go. So it's a 50 micron layer every three seconds. I know it comes here where it shows you conventional laser-based systems against this. So this is really where it's still using the same technology where you need to build a part, you then need to center the part before you actually get your, uh, your, your finished part. But it's really the throughput and the volume that this technology will sort of um, be where additive will be in the next sort of five, 10 years. It's got to be quicker, it's got to be faster, it's got to be more accurate. So on the right side, you've got a printer, and on the left side, you've got a furnace. So the, the whole Use of this technology is to sell. It's interesting this here. So this is laser-based technology where you produce 12 parts in a day because of the size of them. Then the desktop metal production system, as you can see, produce 560. And I think when you start to consider. Um, like that bracket in that automotive car that you think well okay i need to produce ten thousand of these they can only be additively manufactured am i going to go and buy myself 
200 laser based systems to fit into a warehouse. And I think this is really where we start to see the, how the technology in, in additive is still very young. It's still looking at the ways at which it can be used in production. Production is really where the technology is moving. Metals is certainly the, the future. But from my experience and from what I see in the future working with CAD and with CAM, with additive and with subtractive, all of that combination I think is going to be key. It's going to be driven by design and we've now got aids with design, with the genetics of design so you can then use tools like that to get to the ultimate design of a particular part. We've then got the ability with certain software packages to CNC machine the parts. We've got conventional laser-based additive, we've got desktop metal additive, and we've got like the production system. So moving forward, I think there are a great deal of uh, opportunities and developments within additive that are just far exceeding anything that was ever possible just by considering it as a prototyping solution, which it still is. Um, I received um, a conversation, oh sorry, I had a conversation this morning with a, a technical department where they want four 3D printers sent to people's homes. It's <laughs> and whether that is something that is going to uh, uh, happen, I don't know, but it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of things that are starting to develop in the 3D printing world. Um, production uh, with aerospace, we can start to see making things lighter so that planes can fly, uh, fly further and things like that. The automotive application uh, and lots of other things. So that ends my presentation as such. I know it was a little bit um, disjointed in certain areas, but hopefully from the gist of what I showed you here, it, uh, it gives you an idea that we have a, a great set of manufacturing opportunities that can be sort of developed and move forward. Um, and I haven't looked at the questions. Are there any questions up there, Nick, that people I've, have? I've been following asked? along. Yeah, David's got one now, and I'll, uh, and I'll, what, I, what I was thinking of doing to make this more fun um, is to maybe unmute uh, everybody and allow to uh, people <laughs> actually ask their questions in person rather than. Uh, so I've unmuted all the speakers. And so. Yeah. Um, if anybody would like, so David, would you like to actually ask your question? Uh, yeah, I was uh, just a quick question about the uh, uh, the, uh, the, the three D printer you just showed about the. Uh, uh, I was just asking, the, is like is that fully automated? Um, basically, like is that like basically how much like you know uh, operating does it need from an actual engineer? You know, during a sort of a day period. With the production system, do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's um, at the moment it's it's going it's it's manual. Um, the auto, the the bottleneck in this process is really the sintering. So what what will happen is the automated aspect of the process will actually come through automated uh, pick and place robots to go into the sintering station because if you're producing six hundred parts a day. Um, the actual loading and unloading of the production system to get a build started is probably about half an hour. But okay. to actually unpack the parts and center the parts and put them into the oven, that's where the, uh, the, the time will come. So it's still early stages as far as what the parts are and the production volumes, but automation going down the line, I think, is certainly, certainly key. Okay. Any other questions for Colin? We've got uh, we've got a few minutes, so I think um, uh, that that uh, I, I enjoyed that, Colin. Although it was uh, obviously hard with the feedback and everything, I think we're. Still... Oh, I'm sorry about that. It's... <laughs> no, no, no. I think that's uh, you know I think I think we're all learning. Uh, we're going online really quickly, considering you know this is you know two or three weeks of sh shutdown. I think by the end of the summer we're going to be real pros at this. <laughs> Have you um, have you had yeah. any requests as a company to do some of the uh, the ventilator printing uh, and work? 
Well, um, yes and no. Um, Statusists, for example, the manufacturer is starting to offer uh, discounts off materials for customers who have got machines. Mm. Uh, if, for example, they are offering their services free to customers to make some of the surrounds, then we give like a 50% discount on the materials. If they are working in the NHS and making parts, uh, then we can offer 20% on the materials. But if it's for commercial gain, then that they, they decide if they want to pass that on. So there's every other post on LinkedIn is about ventilators, it's about masks, it's about door handles, it's about great. So there's a massive energy and, and interest through this. Um, and I think we're all involved in this now. And I think the, the uh, going down the line is um, whatever we can do to help whatever whatever machine is available that can build something that can just protect one more person i think is it's going to be a valuable service moving forward so it's all of the strategist designs that we've done are all online so anybody that wants to make any of these can sort of uh, i can i can send the link and they can download the cad models but i think there's lots of companies doing this now yeah. um anyone else That's, have uh, questions yeah is it possible to incorporate composite materials in in mass 3d printing not so much in mass 3d printing but the one technology which i didn't mention on here is called the fiber system it's a desktop metal fiber uh, and that is actually laying down a, a composite ribs so it can sort of uh, build composite parts it can either do it as uh, chopped fiber or it can do it as, as a strip fiber if you just type in um, uh, desktop metal fiber technology you'll see some videos of, of how that's that's being used but from the mass produced systems that's not uh, it's not a technology that's available at the moment now it's metal injection molding technology is the it's the core technology that's driving it. So it's all generally to do with metal powders. But there are composite machines out there now and they're getting bigger, they're getting better. Uh, and like I say, the, the, the desktop metal fiber system that was launched in November last year at Euromold is gonna be one of, the, uh, one of the key technologies I think going forward. Anybody else? So I, I've, I can carry on if no one else wants to. <laughs> um, so I think I, um, one of the, uh, so I, I've introduced uh, these guys to um, uh, essentially both of those systems you've talked about there, which was the, the bound metal deposition. And then you went on yeah. more into the sort of the binder jetting, uh, material binder jetting system. So maybe you just yeah. like to clarify, just, I think because what happened, I think the video went on quite quickly and I think, so you've got your studio system and then you've got the full production. Maybe just yeah, the Yeah, the, the studio system is like an FDM printing process. Uh, so it really just uses a, a rod of metal and wax that you extrude to a heated nozzle and it will create like a, a, a green part still made up of metal and wax. Yep. You put it through a debinder that then removes the wax and then you put it through a sintering oven that shrinks it down. The beauty of that system, it's uh, it's an office-based type technology. It allows anybody to get onto it, so it's safe, there's no powder, there's no mess, there's, there are no risks involved in that. And that is a printer that uh, we've got one guy who's looking at buying one for his uh, to make legacy spare parts on vintage motorbikes and things like that. You know, it yeah. can be rocker arms, it can be things like this. So he's, he's looking at just getting that for himself, but using us as a company to offer a service for the debinding and the sintering. Yeah. So that is flow key metal additive, which is quite good. The uh, production system and the, uh, and, and, and the more expensive sort of high volume system is using a powder that lays uh, a whole layer of powder. In effect, it works like, um, like the laser based systems where it's depositing a layer of powder but instead of it using a laser, it's actually using a combination of, of, of binder and metal powder. And where it's bound, it then secures it. But it's still going through um, a sintering process to give you your end user part. 
But if you wanted to go online, you say desktop metal studio system, there are loads of videos, desktop metal production system, and you'll see the difference there anyway. They are different technologies from the same manufacturer. Yeah. Um, I've got a question there from uh, JC. Um, will we have access to the presentation? Uh, are you, I've recorded, by the way, I've recorded this, Colin. Hope you don't mind. Okay. And, uh, no, no. I'll, well, I'll, I, I, yeah. I sent you the copy anyway, didn't I? You yeah. have, yeah. So you have got the, yeah, so yeah, you, you, you can freely distribute that. That's not a problem. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, I think it's a little bit big to go on Blackboard, but what I'll do is uh, I think <laughs> we, <laughs> we can get this, uh, with the recording of this session now, and that's going to go up on Blackboard. Blackboard's the, um, where, the, where all the students get their module stuff. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, I think it's a one gigabyte presentation because for some of the movie pres uh, movie videos, that, movie videos. That's the same thing. Some of the, <laughs> uh, the movie clips are, are, are quite large, uh, and some of the graphics. But uh, no, you can freely distribute that if you wish. And if there's any topic in there that you want to elaborate on or want some specific information, then uh, if you wanted to kindly pass my email on to anybody that wants more info, Nick, then that's fine. Yeah. There's a question here from um, Chris Patel. Uh, in terms of the composition with binder plus metal, would you say there is much improvement to be made in that area to improve mass producibility? Mass production. Mass producibility. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the thing with additive, you always have to take into account generally, is that every time you make something, it depends on the application. If you've got to machine it afterwards, then you do have another process. So it's trying to look at ways where if it was conventionally made in four or five bits and bolted together and you can make it in one, you can then start to see that as a benefit. Production starts to come through. If it has to go through lasers, we've got companies in the UK that have got 50, 60 laser systems that are all making two or three parts. Um, and Going down that route continually means a half a million pound investment each time and every three or four machines, another operator and things like that. So it's, 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 it's a little bit unsustainable in one respect because of the, uh, if the production increases. So we're seeing with the uh, technology that ourselves and HP, so there are a few people involved in this now, are starting to use the, the powder system in the way that we're doing uh, that is the way to sort of get the production. But we're still seeing people that come up with conventional applications where if it's as easy to machine it conventionally, that's the best way. You don't just use the technology for the sake of it. Yeah. And I see quite a lot of examples, you know, can you can you 3D print washers and things like that? And you think, well, of course you can. But they're going to cost you two pounds fifty each and they cost you ten P if you go down to being curious. Yeah. It's trying to get the application right to suit the technology. I've got to say, I mean, I've I've only recently, um, you know, because we've we've been staunch users of SolidWorks, um, you know, and most of our modules uh, have been using SolidWorks for the last couple of years. But just recently, um, with um, I've started playing with the Fusion 360 and the new NetFab Premium. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they've they've um, they, they, they've you know I've only just realised in the last in this term that they've become free for um, for use for students and for educators yeah and yeah. you know i've yeah. been so impressed particularly with the fusion 360 which you were showing some examples there of the ease yeah. in which you can use it it's not it's not as if it wasn't there in other software packages but now it's just become you know it's quite streamlined it's 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 amazing because um and strat it's not strategist sorry autodesk has released some information if you go onto the autodesk website where anybody at home now can actually download it and have it free for two months yeah. so you can, anybody can play with it for free so yeah. even though you're in educational facilities if you've got sort of uh you know you're stuck at home <laughs> through the, the few weeks a month and things and you wanted to have a look at something then you can just download that that free but yeah the, i think the fusion 360 is is it's just an amazing uh software and it covers in my opinion, a, a, quite a flexible range of, of applications. So you can uh, you can take a scan model in, for example, that as you probably may have experienced in the past, is that 
scan data of, a, of a, you scan your hand for example it's full of holes it's full of all sorts of problems yeah. and a combination of using like fusion 360 and netfab as well where you can actually repair a lot of this and even change features on it uh, are quite quite good so it's mm -hmm. um I, I i really enjoy working with both software and because it's so cheap it's to me i can't if if you had to pay for solidworks which i know is a few grand and even if you've got to pay for Fusion 360, it's 365 quid. So it's, yeah. to, to me, if you can try and wean yourself off SolidWorks, then I think that it's going to be a, a, a bit more of a benefit. Yeah. Okay, well, um, uh, any other questions from you guys? Um, no? Okay, well, you can, if you're really kind, um, with the... Um, your management window you can actually go and put more you can actually give a round of applause uh, for, uh, i don't know if you can see it but it'd be very yeah there we go thanks someone's got it so if you can give him uh, give colin a round of applause for doing this from home um thank you very much colin for coming in and no um, no no i'm, no, I'm gonna joking. hold on and have a quick chat because i'm just gonna as it's the last lecture of term i'm just gonna sort of um make some things clear um Oh, okay. oh, there is a final question before we go. Have you had any increase in orders since the lockdown? No, they dropped, they've dropped off a cliff, to be fair. Um, but what we have seen is in probably the last two weeks, some strange inquiries on people, can you 3D print this, can you 3D print that? And you think, well, so it's, uh, it, it's looking at as if they're using it as a solution for things where it, it's not suited. Uh, and I think that some of these things might come through, you know, as we start to see a lot more in the press, but um, who knows, who knows what's going to come through because it, it, we don't quite know what catches on to the, uh, to the mass attention. And like you said, with the ventilate, ventilators, with the respirators, with, uh, uh, door handle protectors and things like that. We're starting to see um, potential in there, but it's not something that we're trying to sort of focus on in one respect because it, it, if somebody's got no CAD experience, then uh, it, it, it can create a problem as just saying, "Well, I get a printer and print something." So it's yeah. um, we don't we haven't seen that uh, that increase yet anyway. Okay, Colin. Well, thank you very much. And um, I'm sure we'll be uh, in touch uh, soon. Anyway. No, no, no. Thank you for the invitation, and and I hope everybody enjoyed, enjoyed the the presentation and the and the lecture, and uh, happy to help out in the future. So goodbye to one and all. Take care. <laughs> oh, hi, Colin. If I can just keep you guys on a bit. Um, so, uh, everybody still there and hear me? Um, okay, I'm gonna. Yep, cool. Okay. Um, right, so um, officially, I think. Um, hang on, see if I'm getting my dates right here. But I think that would have been the last lecture of term. Oh, well, before the Easter break. Am I right? Or am I sort of in in hometown in in home? Yes, I'm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, but. I'm I'm look what I I'm more than happy um I'm going to carry on working over Easter. Uh, we're not going anywhere. I'm stuck at home anyway and I think most of you stuck as well. So you've still got project stuff to do uh and I'm more than happy to use the time to catch up. So um I've got office hours on um uh, Monday mornings normally I'm booked through to about 11. 11 till 1 I've got my postgraduate office hours. You're welcome to phone in then. You're welcome to arrange one by email. I'm going to keep my Wednesday morning office hours as well. Um, and, and I would encourage all of you um, just to, you know, um, call in and, you know, just, just have a chat about whatever you want project-wise or course-wise or anything you're worried about. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, um i hope oh cool you got <laughs> thanks dan um so you've all um i hope you all keep keep safe and um you know i'll, I'll be putting this video up later on um uh, and um anyway we'll, we'll 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 stay in touch okay i hope you enjoyed that and uh we'll talk to you soon
Buenas noches. Okay. Bye.